Hi, good afternoon. My family has a special connection to the Tampa Clearwater area because we actually rehearse Ringling Brothers Born and Bailey Circus here every single year. And uh, next year, we're actually relocating our entire corporate headquarters to Ellington, Florida. So I'll be spending even more time in the area, and we're looking forward to that. You don't know me at all, but anybody who knows me knows that I'm a very, very straightforward person. So with that being said, we're here to talk about what we all came here to talk about, which is money. Most of us have been led to believe that talking about money is tacky, inappropriate, and offensive. But we're here to get the dialogue started in a very positive way. You've taken the first step by coming here today and to, to take advantage of all the great resources that Jada and JWI have to offer. And you may have even overlooked one of the most powerful resources in your life, your mom. I've given a lot of top, I've given the, this topic a lot of thought and actually as a new mom myself, I'm now constantly thinking of the values and lessons I want to impart to my own daughter. And as you moms in the audience know, that once that internal debate takes hold, you're constantly nagging at yourself about what to say, what not to say, and what to do, and what not to do. All of us deal with money every day and will continue to do so every day going forward. It's unavoidable. However, how you deal with your personal finances is up to you. You can take control and manage them or they will control you. Ultimately, there are only four ways we treat money once we have it. We can either spend it, save it, invest it, or share it. There's a lot of confusion and discussion around money, and it can at some time seem quite complex and overwhelming. But it does really boil down to these four relatively simple principles. My first lessons about money came from my parents, Kenneth and Bonnie, who in spite of our comfortable upbringing made sure that my two sisters and I understood that our circumstances were a privilege and not a birthright. My parents, although successful, tried hard not to spoil us just because they could. Now that my husband, Jonathan, and I, who he was supposed to be here today, but due to the weather in the Northeast, went home, but we just became parents, it's a dilemma we face in, in raising our child every day. I might not have known it at the time, but when I think back to how my parents raised me and my sisters, I see they were laying the foundation for us to become competent, strong, independent young women. And a key part of that empowerment was teaching us to manage our own finances. These are the same principles that Jonathan and I hope to impart to our daughter, Piper. And it's never too early to start the discussion of money and finance. So although she's probably sleeping through this conversation, she is here today. My earliest understanding of money probably came when I was seven years old and was first given an allowance. It was 1985 and I made 50 cents a week for doing various chores around the house, such as cleaning my room and washing the dishes. However, unlike most parents, mine went a step further and required that out of the 50 cents, at least half of it had to be saved. I could, of course, save the entire amount and spend up to 25 cents, but week in and week out, I, could ch I had to deposit at least a quarter into my piggy bank. I could also choose how much of the remaining half went to Sadaka. At that time, I attended Hebrew school once a week and felt incredibly proud when I could march up to the Sadaka box with my money and provide it towards someone else's welfare. As I grew older, I, I could decide how I wanted to donate the funds. This was an important learning because it was one of the first times that I felt responsible for a relatively grown up decision. I could choose how much to give to charity and which organization to give to and it made me feel good to do it. For anyone, but especially a seven year old, that's very empowering. Even in 1985, adjusting for inflation, a quarter wasn't getting me very far. So I made sure that I saved as much as possible because only then would I be able to afford something special with my total savings. It was 1987 and I brought the brand new hit album, Bad, by Michael Jackson. And I was so proud of myself for earning enough to be able to afford that cassette tape all on my own. I felt tremendous pride when I opened up the Hello Kitty wallet and I took out $11 in cash to purchase that tape. That cassette tape held more value to me because I recognized the hard work it took to save the money and therefore I had a greater appreciation for it. 
By the time I was 13, I had my own bank account with the money I had been saving, plus holiday and birthday checks, and of course my bat mitzvah gifts. I learned how to balance a checkbook, and while it may seem a bit dated in this era of online banking and QuickBooks, it's, still a, it's a skill I still use both in my personal life and, in my, uh, and dealing with my finances at work. Once I hit high school, my allowance had increased 550% to $25 per week. But the same principles apply, half for savings and the other half to be used in my discretion. As my tastes evolve from tapes to CDs and toys to accessories, so did the cost of those items. I saw the benefits of having savings to be able to purchase a few items when hanging out at the mall with my friends. But more than just possessions, I was now interested in fun experiences that were independent of my parents, like going to the movies with friends or weekend social activities. My parents always made sure we had the necessities, but I knew the cost of recreational activities was coming out of my own pocket, so I had to budget and understand budgeting in a new way to make sure I could do the things I wanted to do. Budgeting is equivalent to setting goals. And if my goal was to get a new CD player or go on a trip with friends, then it was within my control to save for those splurges. A clever and gen generous management technique employed by my parents is what they refer to as an incentive plan. They motivated me to save money by matching a mutually agreed upon savings goal once I met it, sort of like a bonus. Consider it my early exposure to a 401k program. And if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. <laughs> Spend or save, the choice was mine, but again, a valuable lesson. It was a small gesture, but I took away a basic investment understanding of how your money can earn money through savings accounts and various other investment funds. Now, the concept of investing may seem like something you need lots of money to do. That's not necessarily true. You can profit on your saved money in many different ways. It can become complicated, but it doesn't have to be, and I recommend a simple low-risk start. My first investment lesson came through a generous bat mitzvah gift of several shares of Disney stock. I remember running around the house telling my younger sisters, I own Disney, I own Disney. And my father took this opportunity to explain to me what it means to own shares of a publicly traded company. Each morning at breakfast, he would open up the business section and we would turn to the pages of the New York Stock Exchange and look up Disney's value per share and compare it to the value of the shares on the day the shares were bought from it. We would then follow the news about Disney to understand why the value of the company might increase or decrease. He would then ask me if I thought we should sell the stock and receive the cash value or keep it invested based on the strategic plans of the company. If, there was, if I wanted to sell the shares and there were other companies of interest, I could, we discussed what they were and I could reinvest the money. At the same time, I, at the time I didn't realize I was getting an economics lesson before my morning algebra class. But those lessons are now part of my life every day and they came to me in the form of quality and treasure time with my dad. You too can start by choosing a company you're interested in and that has a share price you can afford. Today, it's even easier to track, track your stock valuations with the stock ticker on your smartphone and readily accessible information through one quick entry in a search engine. Just remember that all investments have risks, so be sure to invest cautiously. In spite of what you might think, it wasn't that long ago that I was a teenager. But since then, the internet has changed a lot for us in terms of accessibility to stock quotes and the proliferation of online shopping. However, in the late 1990s, it was still a big deal that I did not have a credit card. I grew up making purchases with cash, which taught me that money wasn't disposable. It may seem incidental, but by physically handling the bills, spending felt more real and therefore the purchase materials more treasured. I could watch how quickly or slowly my wallet slimmed, and my relationship with money was always tangible. Once in college, I had more control over my finances, and the same principles I had put into practice growing up mattered more now than ever. They were just a bit more complex. One of the most important life experiences I had while attending college was managing a comprehensive budget. At the start of every semester, I was given an allowance for school. 
I created a budget for myself that included the funds I would need for books, housing, groceries, social activities, etc. And But I kept a journal of my spending. That way I knew when and where and how my money was being used. Moreover, at this point, I still didn't have a credit card, just a debit card tied to my account. Physically seeing where I was spending the money and having the ability to track it, track it proved instructive. By paying with cash or using a debit card, you must track your balance. It helps avoid overdraws and debt. Whatever I withdrew on Monday, I needed to ensure and monitor so that I had funds for the weekend. At the time, it was difficult for me to understand why I didn't have a credit card. A lot of my friends did. It would have been so much easier to buy that amazing handbag I saw on sale in Soho if I didn't have to run to the ATM to withdraw money and check my balance. But what my parents knew that I hadn't yet realized is that credit cards can be dangerous because they remove the palpable connection to your money. It's hard to keep track of how much you're spending when you're constantly paying with a piece of plastic. They allow you to spend money you don't have. People often get into financial trouble because more is being spent than what they have left at the end of the month to pay off the card. Financial debt occurs when interest is accrued on the unpaid amount and this number multiplies over time. And it becomes challenging to pay down this amount as it continues to grow. Once you eventually pay it off, you have now paid twice as much for that handbag you thought was on sale. You have to ask yourself, was it really worth it? Now, I'll tell you a story about how all of this budgeting and monitoring, monitor, monitoring paid off for me. It was my sophomore year at NYU and I was enrolled in the Tisch School of Arts as a photography major when my camera was stolen. The Nikon camera was a gift from my parents as they prepared to send me off to college and it went missing from my New York City apartment during my 20th birthday celebration. I was devastated. How was I going to explain this to my parents and explain their disappointment? As I needed the camera for my major, I had to get a new one immediately. But before calling my parents with the unfortunate news, I decided to check my bank account, and to my surprise, I actually had saved enough money to purchase a new one all on my own. I comparison shopped around New York City to land the most favorable deal, and I used my debit card to purchase the new Nikon. Making this unforeseen purchase required me to adjust my budget and scale back in other areas in order not to overextend, overextend my financial limits and have to ask my parents for money to subsidize my lifestyle. I was very grateful for the prepaid meal plan my parents had signed me up for because I had to forfeit nights of food delivery and dinner with friends to build back up my reserve funds. It was quite some time later that my parents became aware of what had transpired and although they were disappointed that I didn't communicate to them sooner, they were also proud that their lessons on fiscal responsibility had made it possible for me not to need to. For me, this was a huge moment of clarity because I realized that saving up for, my camera, for that camera saved me from listening to a very long lecture from my parents. <laughs> College overall is a time of great development as you transition from adulthood and all the responsibility that comes with it. It was no exception for me. My parents had been laying the groundwork for my financial independence beginning back in 1985 so that I would graduate college, not only with a university degree, but with the ability to become completely self-reliant. All of those learnings certainly didn't end at college. My job today requires dealing with financial matters from budgeting to, for a new production, determining performer salaries, carving out dollars for marketing and advertising, to structuring charitable gifts, and so forth. I also oversee the artistic development of our shows, including the next Ringling Brothers Circus. But as my father always tells me, there is no such thing as creativity with a blank check. Sometimes the most imaginative ideas come from asking ourselves, are we really going to get, how are we really going to get the biggest bang for our buck? You may not ultimately choose a path into the business world, but I can tell you, and I can't overstate this enough, that all of life's work, no matter how creative or how far removed from finance, has to deal with some level of finance and financial matters. Whether it's counting out rhinestones to embellish costumes for the greatest show on earth or making a grocery list for your own family. I started this speech by saying we only handle money in four ways. 
We spend it, we save it, invest it, or share it. What can you do today? First and foremost, start by having a conversation about budgeting and financial responsibility with someone you trust. My parents made sure they started that dialogue with me when I was seven, and I plan to do it with my own daughter when she turns about that age. It's clear by your presence here today that you've already taken that step. Making a budget doesn't have to be complex or even spreadsheet formatted. Just make a list of what you have or what you need or want. Take all of your assets into account here, allowance, part-time job, gifts, etc. The budget should have the four categories I've discussed. Spending, saving, investing, sadaka. Keep a journal to track what your expenditures are so you can understand where your money is going and to ensure that it's been put to good use. There's some great apps now that help with this and make it much more efficient, like Mint, Expenditure, or Moneybook. If you budget properly, you may find you have the funds you need for necessities with some left over for splurges. And you might even discover that cutting out a $3 Starbucks each day saves you $1,100 towards your vacation fund or car payments. If you use cash, you'll feel the spending more in the moment, and for me it always triggers the question, do I really need this? Before you go shopping, it's important to educate yourself. Take the extra time, shop around. The internet has made that so much easier, and there's a slew of shopping comparison apps out there, like Amazon Price Check. With a little extra effort, you can again save some money and put that money to better use somewhere else, like maybe a new laptop for school. And speaking of school, most of you sitting in the audience will probably be going off to college in a few years, if not sooner, and will soon witness what has become an all too, too familiar scene. You'll be walking through the quad and you'll see three, four, maybe even more tables that credit card companies have set up to entice you to open an account with them. This will be very tempting as they'll promise great introductory rates, maybe some special gifts uh, and extra services and probably a t-shirt. I encourage you all to weigh these offers very carefully. Carrying debt is not a burden you want to bear. And once these amazing introductory rates expire, you, usually after a few months, you could be paying as high as 20% interest. That means a $50 sweater will be $60 if you don't pay your bill in full the first month, $72 if you don't pay it in full the second month, and so on and so forth. Don't get fooled. Either pay in cash with a debit card or be prepared to pay your monthly bill in full. Instead, maybe take the interest rate equivalent into a savings account or money market fund and make that money work for you. On the flip side, there will come a time when you may need a credit card. And when managed appropriately and paid off is a first step in creating a positive credit history. I finally got my own credit card, but I remember that it, w it took me until I was a senior in college. And then I realized I was ready for my first credit card. But to my surprise, MasterCard was not ready for me. They denied me a card due to lack of credit history. It was then I realized not all credit cards are created equal. In order to get approved by one that offered me the best benefits and low and stable interest rates, I needed to prove I was responsible. So I signed up for a Bloomingdale's card while, while out shopping for a new winter coat. Signing up for the card offered me a 10% discount on every purchase I made that day and limited, per and limited purchasing power, preventing me from doing too much damage with it. I knew I didn't shop at Bloomingdale's that often and wouldn't spend more than I could afford. When I used the card, I was conscious of what I was purchasing and I always paid the balance of the card in full each month. That card paved the way towards the beginning of a solid credit scoring, which landed me the credit card I wanted, and years later, a bank approval for a mortgage on my first home. Be mindful of credit cards with high interest rates, and if you don't heed my advice and pay your bill in full, always make sure you pay at least the minimum balance. Finally, try to stick to your plan, but know that it'll evolve as you do. If you splurge, don't beat yourself up for it. Budgets are a give and take. Sometimes it means giving up buying up sometimes it means giving up buying those new boots because you went over your minutes on your cell phone bill. When and if you begin to invest your money, 
Educate yourself on stocks by reading the financial section of your favorite online news source to understand companies and the opportunities and risks. Always contribute what you can to Sadaka, but make sure you support the company's initiatives and that the money is being used towards services and provisions for others, not overhead. If you aren't able to contribute financially, you can always volunteer your time. It's a great way to learn about the organization because you will be directly engaging with their beneficiaries. In the end, my goal for you is to have autonomy over your finances. Having a working financial awareness and being fiscally responsible are key to having choice and freedom. It's really about knowing what to do with your money that matters. Stay, save, spend, save, invest, Sadaka. When I was young, it was so important for me to feel like I had a say in the matter, that I could make my own decisions within reason, of course, but that I was trusted. My parents gave me the foundation and set parameters and then they trusted me. And their trust meant a lot and I took that responsibility very seriously. I followed their example and used the knowledge they passed along to me to carve my own path. I hope you're able to do the same. And I hope that me being here today maybe plays some small part in helping you chart your own course. <laughs>